Welcome to the, uh, this is a combined service. All our five services combined into one this weekend because uh, 1,300 of our adults, youths, and children are away in KL for their camp. So for our camp, rather. <laughs> so I ask you to please keep your Bibles open to Joshua 22. And if you'd like to follow it using a sermon outline, uh, it's actually on the e-bulletin. You can download that from the church website. Shall we pray together for God's help to understand and obey his word? Holy Spirit, would you please pour out upon us wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be taught by you in Holy Scripture and opened to receive all that leads to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for joining me in prayer. Now, can I ask you now to just quickly turn to your neighbour and uh, share with you what are some world wars or conflicts that you, you, have, you know about that's going on right now? Any wars in the world that you know about? Any conflicts that you know of? Okay, so the children may also be able to share with your parents, right? You've heard about it in school? Right, so we are no experts. We don't know all the conflicts there are in the world. But let me just show you this map. This is from the Council for Foreign Relations in the United States. And they have been tracking armed conflicts around the world for more than 100 years, since 1921. Now, this is the latest map as of last Wednesday. Can you tell where these trouble spots are, those spots in red? It looks like chicken pox. Well, these are perhaps some better-known better conflicts to us here in Singapore. The war in Ukraine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the civil war in Myanmar, the North Korea con crisis, and the confrontation over Taiwan. These are some that we perhaps know better about. But do you know that closer to home and on a lighter note, we have food fights between Singapore and Malaysia in the north. So it's quite dangerous. We are in enemy territory right now in KL. For example, this war rages over whether laksa, does it originate from Katong or Penang? And sometimes Indonesia does get dragged in as well because there's Sarawak laksa, right? Well, I quote this CNA article from January. It says, the latest round involved Malaysian actor host Hero Thai, lambasting Singapore cuisine on an episode of a Taiwanese variety show. So even Taiwan gets brought in. When Thai said, Singapore stole Hainanese chicken rice, bak kut teh, and cha kui tiao, and nonya kui from Malaysia. It rubbed some Singaporeans the wrong way. Okay? But it's not just between Singapore and Malaysia. Even locally within Singapore, we also have food fields which is the title of a CNA series that explores where is the original or the best Tai Hua Ba Chor Mi or Katong Laksa or Ji Xiang Ang Gu Kui. And all of us have our own views on this. So let's not fight over them. Notice what many of these wars or conflicts have in common. You realize that they are often between those who are close to each other, right? whether between neighboring states with a common history or heritage or within the same country uh, due to politics, or even between siblings and family members. It seems like the closer you get, the more likely you are to disagree. Now, the psalmist says in Psalm 133, he says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So how can God's people, who have been made one in Christ Jesus, how can we remain one in unity? This is especially relevant for ARPC today, not just because we are now separated from our brethren in church camp by the Strait of Johor, but also because we are going to transit into one church in three places later this year. So the question is, will you and I remain as one, or will we allow our differences to pull us apart from one another? Joshua 22 shows us how we can keep our unity by a common faithfulness to the Lord. 
verses 10 to 20 introduce the crisis of Israel's national unity due to the existence of a questionable altar. Verses 21 to 29 give clarity to that unity as the purpose for the altar is explained. And then verses 30 to 34 cement that unity by the naming of the altar as witness. So in the first nine verses of Joshua 22, so far in the context, Joshua has commanded the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh for keeping their word and fighting along with their brothers. And then he sends them back to their inheritance over the Jordan to the land of Gilead on the east, as opposed to the land of Canaan, which is on the west. And in sending them away, he gives them this command. Shall we read this verse together? Only be very careful to observe the commandments and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cling to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Notice how many verbs there are. Observe, love, walk, keep, cling, and serve. Children, how many, how many are there? Are you counting the words in red? Six, yeah, very good. So there are six verbs right here. So the question is, how will these two and a half tribes fare with keeping this command with six action words? Well, immediately we read in verses 10 to 20 of a crisis of unity that arises from a questionable altar. It says there, And when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. This eastern tribe immediately built an altar beside the Jordan River. It's not exactly clear whether it is it's on the east or the west of the river, in the land of Gilead or Canaan. Well, verse 11 seems to hint that it is on the west, so it's on the site of the other nine and a half tribes. But the altar is clearly meant to attract their attention, and we'll see why in a while. It is of imposing size, and this is the, these are the same words that are used to describe the burning bush that turned Moses aside because it was a great sight in Exodus 3. And when the people of Israel heard of this, the building of the altar, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Why do the nine and a half tribes have such a violent reaction? Well, if you go and search, it's perhaps because of their righteous zeal they want to observe God's command to worship God in the way that he's prescribed. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses had told Israel, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go and bring your various kinds of offerings and sacrifices. And at this time, at this point in time, place that God has chosen to put his name and to dwell among his people is the tabernacle, which is in Shiloh. Ever since the tabernacle was built, that was the only sanctioned, the only authorized place of worship for God's people until the temple was built. And therefore, this new altar is seen as an unauthorized place of worship. How would the nine and a half tribes confront this sacrilegious act? Well, they prepared to make war against the two and a half tribes on the east, but first they thought they should issue them a fair warning. Perhaps they hoped that there'll be repentance so that they may relent from this war. So they sent Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, as well as 10 chiefs, each from each of the tribe on the west of the Jordan, to confront the other two and a half eastern tribes. So in verse 16, Phineas and the priests and the chiefs, they expressed the shed indignation of the whole congregation of the Lord. And they said this, 
What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the Lord of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? They rightfully question the, the eastern tracts about this altar. Right? This altar is questionable. They call it a breach of faith or an unfaithful act. They call it a turning away from or rebellion against the Lord. These tribes, these leaders, also reminded the eastern tribes of their past national sins and the consequences. Just like how, you know, even today, East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, we demand that Japan should teach their role in the Second World War to their school children as a reminder not to repeat the same mistake. Well, the first reminder comes from Numbers 25. Phineas the priest was one of those who had confronted the sin of the previous generation in Shittim, where they had married the Moabites and worshipped their god, Baal of Heor. Here in verse 17, Phineas reminds this present generation of God's righteous judgments at that time. He says, Have we not had enough of the sin of Epior? from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves, and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord, that you too must turn away this day from following the Lord. And if you too rebel against the Lord today, then tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. What's Phineas saying here? Likely, some of the older Israelites who had personally witnessed God's judgment uh, were still alive at that time, which is why Phineas calls it a sin from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves. And the second reminder, more in their recent memory, concerns the sin of Achan at Jericho, and that took place in Joshua chapter 7. Verse 20, Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, Break faith in the matter of the devoted things, and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel, and he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Achan is described here as breaking faith, which is the same charge that Phineas brings against the two and a half tribes as well. Israel, as a consequence, suffered defeats at Ai, and Achan was punished along with his family and possessions. That's why he was not punished alone. Next, in verse 19, Phineas issues this eastern tribes with a choice. Shall we read uh, verse 19 together, everyone? But now, if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord your God. So in other words, what are they offering them? They are saying, if you are not satisfied with your apartment unit, well, we welcome you to come over. You can share our apartment with us. Just don't charge your e-bike overnight and set our flat on fire. Right? That's what they are telling their neighbours. The Western tribes are concerned for their brother's faithfulness to God. So they welcome them and they show solidarity. But they also say that if you rebel, you make us rebels too. They have the right focus. They have a common faith in God. So brothers and sisters in Christ, can I ask, do we have the same concern for one another as well? That our brother and our sister should remain faithful to God. As the writer of Hebrews exhorts us, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So from the Old Testament to the New, we have a God-given responsibility for one another's spiritual well-being to teach, rebuke, correct and train each other with God's word. So you help me when I'm weak and I'll help you when you're in need. Like pacers in a marathon, 
who helps others to set the right pace so that they will finish well. Except that in this race, we are all in it together. Everyone gets to finish and everyone will get the prize of eternal life at the end. Next, in verses 21 to 29, the eastern tribes will clarify their unity with the western tribes by explaining the true purpose for the, for the altar and they will plead their innocence in this matter. They say in verse 22, let's read these verses together. The mighty one, God the Lord. The mighty one, God the Lord. He knows and lets Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to, burn, to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. So they opened their plea with three names for God. They are repeated. The Mighty One, God, and the Lord, which is God's covenant name, Yahweh. Apart from invoking God as their defense witness, they also show their, their agitation at being accused by their brothers. It's like how any faithful spouse who's, who's accused of infidelity might react. There'll be agitated vehemence for their innocence, even indignation, anger at their suspicion. They claim that Yahweh knows, but they also call all Israel, both the eastern as well as the western tribes, as witness. Let Israel itself know. Let Israel know that their conscience is clear, that they lay transparent before God and man. And they are willing to have fellow Israelites or God punish them and judge them if they are found guilty. Now their defense in verses 21 to 29 sounds emotional. It sounds sincere. An Old Testament scholar, David Jopling, notices that there is a possible structure for this, this chapter, chapter 22, verses 10 to 34. And if you look at this structure, you notice that the eastern tribes, the Transjordanians, right, their, their reply is actually at the center of this chapter. These words seem to be central to keep the unity of God's old covenant people. The Cisjordanians, which are the, the nine, nine and a half tribes on the west side, and the Transjordanians, which are the two and a half tribes on the east, they are one God's people. Now, when I was growing up, uh, like many of us, we watched TV programs. Right? In those days, there was no streaming. So there was only SBC, Singapore Broadcasting Corporation, that later became TCS, and now Mediacorp. So no choice, all watch the same program. We are very united then. Well, now I often, I'm thinking back, I often get frustrated by this common trope that our TV series have, which is to create some conflict between the characters because of a series of misunderstandings or miscommunications. And when I was young, I was thinking, why is it that no one bothers to explain or clarify? And then they allow the conflict to fester and fester until you know, things get really out of control. Of course, that's how they suspend the tension and they drag out the drama for us. But thankfully, the book of Joshua doesn't resort to this trope. Right? The tension is very quickly diffused. The Western tribes immediately send Phineas and the ten chiefs to confront what they see as a sin. And the Eastern tribes earnestly explain themselves to clarify the misunderstanding. In verses 24 and 25, they express their deepest fear and they say, No, but we did it out of fear, from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, What have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us, between us and you. The you people of Reuben and people of Gad, you have no portion in the Lord. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Is there a fear that we might have? Now, my brother's family live in Tampines, which is in the east, and we now live in the west, in Hillview. But we meet every Sunday at our parents' home in Badok. But we fear that our children might over time drift apart 
due to the distance and busyness. So we are making special efforts. So last Thursday, the cousins were at Kalang Leisure Park for ice skating and bowling. And this week, we are going for a chalet together. And we realized just this week that our homes are actually connected by the MRT downtown line, although it's 30 stops away, huh? so it's over an hour away. But in those days, there wasn't even MRT. There was no bridge across the Jordan. So the eastern tribes were afraid that the Jordan, which is a physical and geological barrier between your children and our children, it will also act as a spiritual and a relational barrier. Separated by this natural boundary, the brothers may drift apart over time. And so this is of special relevance to us now as a church, right? Because by the end of this year, God willing, we'll be meeting in three locations, in Adam here, in Bishan, and in Tenga. And do you know how far apart the three sites are? Anyone has done uh, any searches? Right? So this is purely based on research from GoThere.sg. Here are the results. No fanciful, uh, no fanci fanciful graphics to show you, but just a table. Uh, sorry, the words are not very clear. Let me just read out. Okay? Between Adam and Bishan, we should be quite familiar. Right? Uh, it's about 6 kilometers by car or 34 minutes by bus. Okay? How about between Adam here and Tenga? So according to GoDad.sg, it's 13 kilometers by car or 46 minutes by bus. Between Bishan and Tenga, 21 kilometers by car or 63 minutes by bus. So which one is the furthest? Bishan and Tenga, right? Okay, but more than this physical and geographical distance, it's the spiritual and relational distance that might, that might start to take place if we choose to focus on the wrong things and we allow ourselves to drift apart. It will certainly be an uphill challenge for us to maintain the trusting of one another, even while we get to know newcomers as well, and even just remembering one another's names. So you can just see a show of hands here. Who, who usually goes to Bishan for services and you're here today? Okay, we praise the Lord that you managed to find your way here. Okay. Uh, of course, not, not that difficult. Okay, but we thank God that uh, you're, we're able to cross between the two locations right now. Right? So when we had ACM, those who are usually at Adam, we went to Bishan. And now that we're in church camp, uh, the people who usually go to Bishan, our brothers and sisters in Christ, come join us here in Adam. Okay? Uh, and for some of us who are in Adam, I noticed I was standing from the back this morning, I was noticing you seem a bit disoriented. Like, who are these new people? And why is it that my usual seat is taken? Okay, so you, oh, where, where can I sit now? Okay, so we are, we are bound to get uncomfortable right, due to this kind of changes. But I think that these Eastern tribes actually give us a good example. They give us a good model to follow. See, in verses 26 to 27, they explain their sincere intention for unity. Therefore, we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between you, us and you, and between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in His presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings. So your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. So see, very quickly, the misunderstanding is cleared up. The tension is diffused. This altar isn't for offerings, but it's for a perpetual witness to the common faith between East and West. So what can we learn from these Eastern tribes? What are some visible witnesses to our common oneness, although one day we may be, we may be meeting apart physically? It's actually what we've already been doing for the past 10 years in Adam and Bishan. Right? So in the way God has prepared us, there's one common identity as ARPC, one team of pastors, elders, and deacons serving across both locations. Ministries also run across locations. Easter and Christmas services and our annual church camp are held together. And we serve as one church every two years as well at Let's Carnival. Many, many things that we do together. 
But the problem is by nature, people are drawn and tied to physical spaces. So whether ARPC at Adam or Bishan or Tengah, it takes effort to remain united while apart. But the furthest distance between us is just 21 kilometers or 23 minutes by car, an hour by bus. Surely we can go to meet with our brethren at another site occasionally. We must keep making efforts to maintain the bond of unity with one another, just as we do to keep up with our family and friends. But even more important than all these human efforts is the witness of our spiritual unity and a common faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. In verse 29, the Eastern tribes, they affirm their commitment to national and spiritual unity by saying, Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offering, grain offering or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. The Western tribes, the, sorry, the Eastern tribes commit to an unwavering allegiance to God and a personal obedience to worship God in the way that he's prescribed. For them, it is in the place that is given to them, which is the tabernacle at Shiloh. Now for us, we are not beholden to any location, whether Adam Road or Bishan or Tengah, but in the person of Christ, who is the true dwelling place of God with his people and by his spirit within us. But if we are not careful, we may one day end up with a super, superficial unity in name only, that we're all ARPC, or perhaps a, super unity, supernatural, a superficial unity in history, but there may be no true unity in gospel truth and faithfulness. And that is so true in many denominations and churches today. They find their unity in the lowest common denominator, whether be it their, their past history together or their current activism, some kind of activity that they do together. But they no longer share the same convictions in the truths of the Bible. They no longer share even a common faith statement with one another. Now in Joshua 22, we see the crisis of faith has been confronted. The clarity of unity has been explained. And now we'll end with the cementing of unity in verses 30 to 34, with an altar called witness. After Phineas and the chiefs heard the explanation of the eastern tribes, it was good in their eyes, meaning they were satisfied. They believed them, they trusted them. And Phineas then says to the two and a half tribes, let's read this verse together. Today, we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. There is no breach of faith. The accusation was overturned. Therefore, there's no judgment. The civil war is squashed before even it begins. But this is taken as a corporate deliverance, the solidarity. The people of Israel, which includes both the eastern and the western tribes, have been delivered from the hand of the Lord. And the presence of God and his favor are among them all. Then Phineas and the chiefs left the land of Gilead on the east and brought this news back to the land of Canaan on the west of the Jordan. And we read in verse 33, And the report was good in the eyes of the people of Israel, just as it was good to their chiefs. And the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad were settled. So peace has been accepted by the leaders and now by the people. In response in verse 34, the last verse, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad caught the altar witness. For, they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Now, if we've been, been counting stones so far in the book of Joshua, out of a total of seven piles of stones, this is the sixth. And this pile of stone stands not as an altar of disobedience, but as an altar 
to the oneness and obedience of God's people. They have unity of faith in the one Lord, Yahweh. Israel's unity is cemented with the naming of this questionable altar, which is now beyond question, witness. So how can you and I be keeping unity of faith as God's people today? Well, for us, as God's new covenant people, our unity of faith is accomplished not by our human efforts, but is accomplished by Christ's work on the cross. Our unity is founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for us. So as Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 16, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, we cannot ever manufacture unity for ourselves through any human means, whether by a common interest that we share or by social activism. We can only maintain the unity that Christ has accomplished for us by his blood on the cross. Our unity or oneness can only be maintained and that we maintain it by our continued allegiance and unwavering obedience to God. So if one day we are no longer pledging allegiance to Christ, then we, we stop being united to Christ's body. We can only be maintaining our unity by loving one another as Christ commands us. And that's why Paul exhorts, he continues to exhort the Ephesians in chapter 4, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been caught, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were caught to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So this is the word of God to us. So here are some, to summarize, here are some lessons that we can learn uh, from today's passage from Joshua 22, to maintain the unity of our faith by a common devotion of faithfulness to the Lord. We can continue to think about how we can challenge and encourage each other to persevere on in faith and obedience because we are our brothers and sisters keepers. We have a shared spiritual responsibility for their holiness. Second, we can clarify and explain any misunderstanding to prevent festering animosity. Let's not allow the crisis or the conflict to wreck the unity that Christ died in order to accomplish. Third, let's cement and express our unity of faith by both physical as well as spiritual witnesses. Make every effort to keep our unity in faith, even when we may be physically apart. So to end, in CNA's coverage of the Laksa rivalry between Singapore and Malaysia, they asked various interviewees for their conclusion. So both sides of the, of the street of Johor, they came to this consensus. They say, why should we fight over food? It's nonsense. I think it's high time we build more bridge rather than erecting walls. So laksa shouldn't belong to Singapore, neither should it belong to Malaysia. Laksa or whatever food for that matter should belong to the stomach, to the great stomach of the people of all the nations. Likewise, the unity of the church doesn't belong to you or me. It belongs to the Lord. He has made us one for the Father's glory. So let us not allow petty differences or perpetrated misunderstandings to allow us, to cause us, to break our unity in the Lord. Rather, let's make every effort to keep the unity of our faith by a common faithfulness to the Lord. He is the one who has made us one 
by his precious blood on the cross. So let's go to God now and pray to him for that unity. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ, your son, died on the cross to make peace, drawing us near to you, our holy God, and making us into one body who were formerly enemies and strangers. Would you now, henceforth, help us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been caught, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Through Christ our Lord we ask. Amen.